Hey guys, uh, so in this tutorial, uh, we'll be talking mainly about, um, well, we'll be talking more about Bayesian uh, approaches to uh, machine learning, um, mainly classification. Um, so if you recall last time, uh, we covered linear classifiers. Uh, today we're going to be talking about probabilistic, uh, probabilistic classifiers. Okay, which are a different approach uh, to classification um, that are also widely used. Um, and then we'll kind of see a special type of uh, probabilistic classifier called the uh, naive Bayes classifier. So um, if we just recall from last week, you know, this is still, we still have the same setup. Uh, so the problem uh, we're given, um, Sorry, uh, we're given a set of data points. Uh, let's call them x1 uh, to xn. Um, and uh, we're given a set of, so these are our data points or our instances. Okay, and so for example, each xi uh, is an observation of the ith um, uh, of the ith individual, so it could have many covariates. So it could have many uh, covariates or features, right? So x uh, is actually a vector, um, xi2, xip uh, transpose, uh, because we usually think about um, you know column column vectors. So here I've I've written a, a row vector. I put the transpose just so you know that it's a it's a column vector. And uh, we have a set of classes. Uh, let's call the classes at this time uh, C. Um, we'll call them C1 uh, to CK, capital K. Um, and these are just numbers. Uh, so for example, last week we saw uh, that C1 was just equal to one. Uh, CK was equal to, uh, you know, just the, the number of uh, K, say 10. Okay, so for, for uh, you know, for, for, for classes, we just have a label. Uh, it could be anything. It could be a number. It could be dog, cat, uh, you know, whatever uh, whatever you're uh, wanting to, to label. Okay, and then um, uh, we usually combine all this information in a data set, uh, D. Uh, so for each um, observation vector, uh, we also have a class that it belongs to. And uh, the index I ranges uh, from one uh, to n. So we have a data set of, of, of n data points. And the goal is if I get a, uh, a new data point, x star, uh, so this is just a vector of observations, but we don't have the, um, we don't have the class corresponding to it, so we, we would like to uh, classify this point, uh, predict the class for this point, uh, then, um, you know, the goal is just to compute uh, the class. So, uh, uh, so the goal is um, uh, given x star to find uh, the corresponding class c star. So the idea is to use d to build a model, uh, a classifier that uh, can can do this, uh, can can kind of solve this goal. All right. So last week we already approached this problem uh, using the linear classifier. Uh, we saw for a few problems. Um, so so kind of the setup I kept drawing was for the uh, for the binary classification problem. Um, and you can kind of always, or for most problems, you can think about the binary problem um, and then generalize to, to more classes. Uh, but usually it's, it's useful to think about the binary problem first. Um, and we, you know, we, uh, we drew, or we kind of computed a linear classifier and we, and we said that's a classifier of the form. Um, you know, just having a straight line between them. Anything that goes on the right side of the line is uh, the cross class or the positive class. Anything below the line is the um, negative <coughs> negative class. Okay, and uh, we saw a few ways of building that, and we'll see, we'll see more as we go through the course. Um, so the idea behind probabilistic classifiers is slightly different. Um, now we're under, we're kind of uh, interested in uh, so for pro 
probabilistic classifier. Uh, we're kind of interested in the probability of class K uh, given X star, uh, which is the probability that uh, you know the, the, that X star belongs to um, belongs to the class K. So, so for example, um, our you know to, to solve this uh, problem, um, you know we would classify C star as being the arg max of the probability of CK uh, given X star, uh, where we maximize over the classes K. So, you know, in, in the example uh, where uh, we have two classes, okay, what we're saying is that C star is going to take the maximum or the argument that maximizes uh, two probabilities, the probability that, uh, you know, uh, Um, either one of these probabilities. So you're going to get a, a conditional probability of class one uh, for the data point, a conditional probability of class two given the data point. Uh, you're going to find out which one is bigger, and then you're just going to assign C star uh, to be the class uh, one or two. Okay? Um, so this is should be familiar to you because um, if you recall the example about the uh, testing and the rare disease, in the previous tutorial, uh, we actually just did exactly this. Uh, we just talked about uh, data as being the test and class as being uh, either having the disease or not. So that was a binary uh, problem there. Okay, so um, so we have kind of our, let me write it up here. We have our kind of decision rule. Um, sorry, and I keep switching between subscript and superscript. Let's just be consistent uh, with the C. Um, okay, so this is our decision rule. Um, and there's kind of two approaches. So there's, uh, so the question is, you know, how uh, do we uh, model uh, probability of CK given X star, right? Given some data, uh, you need to come up with some assumptions uh, to give this thing some kind of functional form, right? So there's two uh, main approaches. The first one is called the discriminative discriminative approach, uh, where you directly uh, model the probability of the class given x star. So this is like the, you know, you know, it's a very direct approach. Uh, we just pick a distribution for this for this thing, we fit it using maximum likelihood, and then we have something to do predictions with. Um, so you can uh, compare this to something you've seen before, uh, linear regression. So e.g. linear regression, right? If you recall, in linear regression, we get a bunch of xi, yi pairs. Uh, we model yi given xi as being a normal distribution uh, with some mean, xi transpose beta, and some variance. So this is a discriminative approach uh, for regression uh, because we're directly modeling the conditional distribution. Um, you can also see this in logistic regression. So logistic regression does a very similar thing. We learned the conditional distribution of the um, uh, yi given xi, and then we do classification with that. Uh, okay, so that's one approach. And basically, it's basically looking at this optimization and directly computing this guy or estimating this guy, um, and then just doing, uh, you know, getting numbers uh, for these probabilities and taking the arc max. Uh, the second approach is called the generative generative approach. Okay, and if you look at um, the if you look at the, the probability of CK given X star. Uh, well, recall that Bayes rule, um, and if you, if you don't recall, please go back to the previous tutorial, uh, tells us that we can write this guy um, in this way. 
Okay, recall this is the posterior times the prior. And um, these are exactly equivalent, right? So this is just Bayes' rule. So we could either uh, work with this quantity, discriminative, or we could work with this quantity, uh, which is generative. And so the generative approach is to um, is to uh, learn uh, probability of x given c and probability of c. And you will often hear the terminology uh, c. Well, c is the probability of c is the prior, right? And here we're talking about classes. So you'll often hear that this is called the class prior. And uh, this probability x given c is the posterior, uh, but it's also kind of uh, conditional on the class, right? So you'll hear this as the class, you'll hear this being called the class conditional uh, distribution or yeah, the class conditional distribution. So that's kind of the jargon uh, that's used in these, um, you know, probabilistic classification approaches, in particular generative approaches. Um, okay, so uh, what does this mean? Well, just to give you an idea, uh, kind of a picture, uh, if we go back to our diagram up here, uh, what does the generative approach look like? Okay, well, imagine that um, uh, what, what this is saying is that for each class, uh, you're going to have a distribution of the x's. Okay, so imagine that for this class, uh, imagine that we're working with a uh, class conditional distribution x given c is going to be normal, mu uh, with a covariance matrix sigma. So if you're confused by this notation, just recall uh, uh, in, in multiple dimensions, uh, the, the normal distribution has a uh, covariance matrix and the mean is a vector, right? Uh, it's not really that important for now, but uh, just imagine, um, you know, in three dimensions, I think I've drawn this before, uh, you have this bell-shaped, uh, you have this bell-shaped distribution. And the way we picture this in two dimensions usually is to draw the contours. So for example, uh, uh, let me use a different color. Um, if you picture this distribution kind of projected down to the two-dimensional space, uh, you would kind of get this uh, picture. Okay, and as the as the circles become more concentrated, uh, what this means is that this is a higher probability, uh, you know, like this the, the peak, the peak uh, gives us a higher probability event. Um, so so as the as the circles get uh, you know kind of tighter and tighter, uh, this is where the peak is, and as they spread out, this is where the low probability is. So this is kind of you can think about this as like kind of uh, you know shining a light on the distribution and then looking at the shadow. Um, on the two-dimensional plane. And the reason we do this is just to picture kind of a three-dimensional object in two dimensions. And the reason I'm mentioning it to you is, well, okay, the assumption now is that we're going to have, for each class, okay, uh, is gonna have a distribution. So this class here, right, you can imagine that a, if we fit a normal distribution, uh, it might look something like this. Okay. And, you know, and this goes on forever, but obviously it gives very small values to, to points that are very far away. Um, so this, this would be the distribution of a class one. And so the point of this is that, you know, uh, and okay, before I, before I tell you the point of it, let's, uh, let's look at this class. You'd have another, uh, you'd have another Gaussian, a normal distribution down here. Uh, maybe this one looks a little bit different. Um, it looks a little bit flatter. So uh, what is the idea then? Well, the idea is that uh, remember, uh, if we get a if we get a new point, let's say a new point here. Let me use a brighter color. Okay, if I get a new point. All right, just having some. 
like a, that's extremely hard to see. Okay. So we get some new point here. Okay. Um, I can measure the probability. I can, I can uh, compute the probability of uh, this guy under class one, right? And then I can, so let's call this our X star point. So I can compute the probability of X star given C1. And then I can also compute a uh, probability of X star uh, given C2, right? Which is this green distribution. And the one that gives a higher, the one that gives a higher number, uh, well, okay, just recall, we also have to multiply by the prior, uh, but the one that gives a higher number uh, is going to kind of be the uh, most probable class. So this is very similar to the maximum a posteriori uh, discussion that we had uh, last week as well. Um, and basically, uh, you know, all we need to learn are these two pieces uh, to, to be able to do this argmax. Okay. Um, you might wonder uh, why I didn't mention uh, probability of X star. Uh, well, uh, okay, again, uh, we're going to take the CK as being the argmax uh, over the K of the probability of um, CK given X. Uh, which we just said that is equivalent to the generative model or the generative ap approach, uh, which looks at uh, this guy in a different form. Okay. Um, but since we're taking the argmax over K, um, this part doesn't play any, any role, right? So we can just look at the numerator. Uh, sorry, this should be probability of CK. Uh, since the, the denominator is just the probability of X, uh, it doesn't make any difference. And, and to see this even uh, more clearly, uh, remember when we had the two cla class problem, uh, we're taking a maximum over probability of um, X given C1, probability of C1, uh, probability of X, and the probability of X uh, given C2, probability of C2 over the probability of X. In other words, you're always going to have this term uh, coming up in every in every uh, part of the maximization. So it actually doesn't make a difference if you just remove it because it's like multiplying all the numbers inside uh, by the same number. Okay, that's another way to kind of see it. So we don't actually need to do it. And recall, um, you know, if you're wondering um, uh, how do we get a proper probability distribution? Okay, well remember probability of x is the probability of um, uh, X given CK times the probability of CK uh, where you can sum up over all K. Remember, this is just the law of total probability. In other words, uh, you can recover P of X just by knowing these two pieces, right? So we can, we can restrict our focus uh, just on these uh, posterior and prior or uh, class prior and class conditional uh, distributions. Uh, just one point here that I want to make. Uh, I don't think we cover it too much in this course, uh, but if you do more uh, machine learning uh, courses, you will see it again, um, is that in our previous problem, you know, the two class, the two class problem, okay, uh, my model there was that x1, uh, sorry, the, 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 the probability of x um, given c1 is a normal distribution uh, with mu one and sigma one. And the distribution for the second class is also gonna be normal uh, with mu two and sigma two. Uh, what I'm saying is that um, each class is gonna have its own, its own normal, normal distribution. Uh, each of those normal distributions is gonna have its own mean. So you can imagine in that picture that I drew before, uh, it's gonna be something like this, right? Um, so we're going to estimate the mean. The, the best estimate uh, of the mean is the sample average. So you can imagine it's gonna be centered right on the, right in the middle. And um, the variance, well, the best estimator of the variance, we, we saw that in the linear regression um, well, tutorial is just gonna be the sample variance. So um, 
you can imagine that for you, I, I'm not going to go through the estimation, but I just want you to picture, you know, how do we actually fit these things? Well, you have data um, and you know that each class has its distribution. You're just going to estimate these parameters in a very standard uh, way using maximum likelihood uh, or least squares or whatever. Uh, but these numbers are going to make sense at the end of the day um, and they're going to be estimated from the data. And similarly for the second distribution, uh, we're going to get mu2, which might be here. So that might be your mu2 and we're going to get some distribution around it. And the shape of the distribution, uh, you know, before I drew kind of like a, a more um, a more of an oval than a, than a round uh, distribution, uh, that's kind of that's that's kind of um, uh, dictated by the the covariance matrix. I'm not going to go into that uh, too much now, but you can look it up uh, if you're interested. Now, uh, there's a really important um, model uh, which is called uh, uh, linear discriminant analysis. Okay, so this is quite an important uh, and very famous model. Uh, it's exactly the same thing that we've done, except we assume that sigma one is equal to sigma two. In other words, uh, we still estimate the covariance, uh, but we we assume that they're they're the same, um, and uh, uh, we assume that um, they're the same. And, and what does that give us? Well, if you picture uh, the decision boundary is actually going to be a linear boundary. Um, sorry, uh, we assume that they're the same and we assume that they're, uh, um, uh, spherical. Uh, so I don't want to talk too much about what this means. It just means that you're going to get a spherical distribution. So kind of a circular, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a asymmetric. Uh, distribution. Um, when we assume this uh, assumption, you can imagine that the boundary, right? What does the boundary represent? Well, it represents that if I get a new point, uh, what does it get classified as? Uh, it's actually going to be a linear classifier. I guess I just wanted to mention this to show you that uh, probabilistic classifiers uh, are not actually too far uh, in some cases from what we've talked about already. Uh, they're not a completely different thing. Uh, they're just kind of a different way of looking at the problem. Uh, where we look at each of the classes and kind of identify some uh, randomness and probability distribution. Uh, but it turns out that the decision that the uh, different approach uh, uh, makes can actually give you the same exact kind of uh, decision boundary as the simple classifiers that we talked about before. Okay, so that's kind of the intro into, um, uh, into probabilistic classification. Now, um, We've already seen, as I said, uh, discriminative uh, models, methods. Uh, so remember, linear regression is discriminative. Logistic regression, which you've seen in the, in the lectures, is also discriminative. discriminative. Um, <clears throat> but in generative models, um, you know, we have uh, these two guys that we need to learn. OK. So, um, let's talk about uh, some problems with actually estimating um, uh, these distributions. So uh, I should say uh, the probability of x given ck, um, you know, this, depending on your problem, the problem that we just saw, uh, this could be continuous or discrete. Right, so continuous is the normal distribution that we just saw, uh, but it could also be discrete, um, which is uh, the stuff that we're going to see uh, in a little bit. Uh, but it could be, uh, you know, um, multinomial or uh, multivariate Bernoulli. Okay, so you, as the modeler, uh, need to look at your data, uh, need to look at the x's. And just ask yourself: Are they continuous uh, values or are they discrete values? Okay, that's that's kind of up to you. Uh, the prior, uh, well, you know, if you have k classes, then it's a discrete uh, problem, right? Uh, so usually in this course we'll be dealing with problems where we have a, a discrete number of classes or, or uh, labels. Uh, so this is usually a discrete distribution, um, and uh, not always. You know, uh, there are some problems where you have uh, infinite number of classes, 
uh, but we won't deal with them in this in this course. Uh, so you can always kind of think of this as discrete. Um, and you know, it could be discrete uniform, which means that uh, every class has the same probability. Um, or it could be like in the uh, disease example uh, last week, uh, you know, the probability of having the disease uh, was was one percent, and the probability of not having the disease was ninety nine percent. So the prior distribution uh, can be anything where you assign uh, specific probabilities to the different uh, things that could happen. Um, but there's uh, so so let's just focus on the discrete. Well, actually, before we do that, let's let's just look at the thing that we're trying to estimate. Uh, okay, we need to estimate this guy. Um, and just recall that each x is a vector, right? So probability of x, uh, let's, let's talk about xi. Uh, this is xi1, xi2, xip, uh, given ck, times the probability of ck. So all I've done here is just uh, unroll the xi. The xi is a vector. Um, but the probability of a vector is, is the same as the uh, probability of uh, unrolling all the specific features of the vector. Now, um, for any distribution, um, what you can do is actually uh, this. Uh, maybe I should make this a bit clearer. So uh, what I have here is the probability of um, uh, let's let's do a simple example. Uh, the probability of a b given c times the probability of c. Okay. Now uh, you should be able to see that this is actually just the probability, the joint probability a b c. Right. This is just an application of Bayes' rule probability of um, ABC can be written like this. And remember that there is, uh, you know, we could, we could rewrite this as probability of A given B and C times the probability of B and C. Uh, this is another application of Bayes' rule. Uh, and we can actually write this using Bayes' rule as probability of B given C times the probability of C. OK, so what I'm doing here is repeated applications of Bayes' rule uh, to go from, from this step uh, to the second step. And then I'm applying Bayes' rule to the second step, to the second probability uh, to get this. OK, and uh, what I'm doing is basically isolating each of the terms uh, by themselves. So if I apply this same logic uh, to this guy, here I have x1 to xi1 to xip, not just a and b. Um, I would get something that looks like this. Okay, and you can see that I'm isolating all the features and conditioning on all the remaining features. And if I keep doing this up to the last one, um, uh, what's the last one going to be? Uh, I P minus one. times the probability of x i p given c k times the probability of c k. Okay, so we can we can rewrite this uh, guy as this. Okay, um, and and I haven't made any assumptions here. You can always do this for any probability distribution. Um, we're just using Bayes' rule, so you can always do this kind of computation. Um, and the reason I'm doing this computation is to kind of demonstrate uh, a difficulty that we're actually going to have in, um, in actually estimating these probabilities. So how uh, to estimate uh, the probability of xi given ck uh, times the probability of ck. Well, how do you estimate prob uh, so, so let's just imagine that uh, each xi um, uh, each feature is going to be binary. And let's just assume that uh, the classes are also binary. So what I'm saying here is that the feature can either be 0 or 1. So all these numbers can be either 0 or 1. 
and also the class is going to be uh, 0, 1. And um, <clears throat> uh, how do we estimate these probabilities? Well, let me, let me actually just give a, a slightly easier example uh, where we're looking at um, the probability of xi uh, given ck uh, for the case where we only have uh, uh, where we have p equals to say uh, four. Well, actually, let's make it easier three. So now we only have three features. Uh, so if I do the same uh, calculation, I get the probability of x i one given x i two, x i three, and c k. Probability of x i two, uh, x i three. Uh, CK, probability of XI3 given CK, probability of CK. Okay, so the reason I'm doing this is because I want to kind of explicitly give you an example with a, a smaller number of features so you can kind of see the problem a bit easier, a bit, a bit more easily. Okay, so what does it mean to estimate probabilities? Well, imagine that, you know, you have a database. Uh, this is the observation one. Uh, observation one is going to have a value for uh, each feature. So here we have three features, and we're going to also observe a class uh, CI. So this is the class of the ith observation. Uh, so imagine observation one, you know, has some values one zero zero, and it belongs to class one. Uh, for observation two, you're going to have maybe a zero zero zero, and it belongs to class zero. Uh, for observation three, uh, you might have one, 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 and it also belongs to zero, and so on and so forth. So each data point uh, can be represented in this in this table. Uh, so uh, why am I talking about this? Well, because I'm just wanting to show you the uh, kind of computational difficulty in estimating uh, each of these components. Okay, so how do I estimate uh, um, how do I estimate the probability of CK? Uh, well, I need to estimate the probability that CK is equal to 1 and the probability of CK equals to 0, right? So what would I do? I would look at my table. These are, these are prior probabilities, so they have nothing. To, you don't need to look at the data at all. Uh, I would look at the number of rows uh, that have uh, CK equals 1 divided by the total number of rows. So this would just be my estimate, uh, my estimate. So I'm just going to draw the squiggly equals to. That uh, would be the number of rows with uh, ci equals 1 and uh, divided by the total number of rows. Right? So I'm just, I'm not talking about anything too rigorous here. I'm just saying, like, you want to compute a probability, you have some data. Uh, these are discrete probabilities. How would you go about doing that? Uh, well, you'd estimate uh, like this. Um, do we need to estimate probability of CK equals zero? Uh, we'll just note that the probability of CK equals zero is equal to one minus the probability of CK equals to one. Uh, so we don't actually need to estimate anything because we've already estimated uh, this guy. Uh, so here we have one parameter to estimate. Okay. All right, what if we need to estimate the probability of xi3 given ck? Okay, well, we need to look at the probability of xi3 equals to 0 uh, when ck is equal to 0, the probability of xi3 equals to 1 uh, when ck equals to 0, the probability of xi3 equals to 0 uh, when ck equals to 1. The probability of xi3 equals to 1 when ck equals to 1. So what am I doing here? I'm looking at all possible combinations of ck and xi3. And in order to estimate these probabilities, um, I need to look at all, uh, if we go back to our table, uh, so to estimate 0, 0, I need to look at my table and look at every time I have a 0, and a zero here uh, divided by the total number of times that I see uh, the class zero. Okay, um, it's the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we just have uh, this many things to estimate. Again, 
this guy is 1 minus the probability that we already estimated. Okay, so if you have the first guy, uh, you don't need to estimate the second guy because, uh, you know, if you add the probabilities, they have to add up to 1. So the probability of xi3 equals 1, uh, given ck equals 0, is just 1 minus the probability that it's not equal to 1. Well, it's equal to 0, uh, given ck equals 0. And same thing here, right? If you have this guy, uh, you don't need to estimate this guy. Uh, you've already got an estimate for it. So how many parameters do we need to estimate here? Uh, well, we need to, to estimate this guy, uh, we need to have uh, two. OK, so there's two things to estimate here. Um, what about, let me, let me use a different color. So we have uh, two things to estimate here, one thing to estimate here. Uh, for this guy, uh, just imagine that you're going to have to compute all combinations of xi2, xi3, and ck. Uh, what you're going to get here is two squared uh, things to estimate. And similarly here, you're going to get two to the power of four things, uh, sorry, two to the power of three things to estimate. Okay, and so you can see as the number of uh, feature, uh, as the number of things in the conditioning statement increase, the increase here is, uh, is increasing as a power of two. It's an exponential increase. So for example, up here, if we make the same assumption about the features only being uh, binary valued and the class being binary valued, uh, how many how many things do we need to estimate to compute this probability? Uh, this would be um, uh, 2 to the power of uh, p, if I haven't made any mistakes. Now, uh, in most problems, uh, p is quite large, right? Number of features can be large. Let's say p is equal to 100. Uh, that means that uh, just to compute the first probability, you need 2 to the power of 100 um, uh, things to estimate. Um, and there's no way in, in the world that you're going to get that many data points, right? It's, it's impossible to get that many data points. Um, so we run into a, a big problem quite early on uh, of uh, too many things to estimate uh, with our data set. Okay, so this is the, the point of this uh, problem is, is really just to motivate uh, some of the difficulties in uh, machine learning and, and Bayesian learning. Uh, you're always kind of restricted by the number of data points you have. Uh, so you need to be kind of um, smart about how you use your data. And this is kind of where the role of assumptions comes in. Um, so the naive Bayes, okay, so let me rewrite. Uh, Let me just rewrite this thing out. Um, so probability of xip given ck, probability of ck. OK, so we said this is kind of too hard to estimate. For any uh, reasonable p, you're just going to have way too many things to estimate. Uh, and also, just recall, uh, if you increase the number of classes, that's also going to increase to the complexity. Uh, so this is not a very realistic thing to try to estimate. Uh, so what does naive Bayes do? OK, well, Naive Bayes looks at this problem and says, OK, well, this problem is, is impossible. Uh, we just don't have enough data points. Uh, so we need to make some assumptions uh, to make life a little bit easier. Um, and the assumption that Naive Bayes makes is the one of conditional independence of features. Okay, and I just want you to pay close attention to the conditional part. It's not just independence of features, right? So I'm not saying that xi1 is independent of xi2. By the way, if you haven't seen this, this just means independent. Okay, uh, so uh, we are not making this assumption. Okay, uh, and what would this assumption mean? It would mean probability of xi1 and xi2 is equal to the probability of xi1 times the probability of xi2. Okay, we are not making this assumption. This is not conditional independence. Uh, conditional independence means that uh, xi1 is independent of xi2 
given that I know the class. OK, uh, so more generally, uh, what we're saying is that xij is independent of xik, uh, given that I know class. Uh, sorry, maybe I should use different letters. Uh, xij is independent of xim uh, whenever j is not equal to m, uh, given that I know the class k. OK, so what does this mean? Um, it just means that uh, you know if if the let's let's say x i j is age. Um, well, maybe not age. Let's look at uh, uh, x i j being the um, blood pressure. And um, x i m uh, being weight. And let's say uh, the class is uh, CK is equal to um, diabetes. Uh, sorry, CK has diabetes. OK, so what we're kind of saying is that um, we're not making the assumption that blood pressure and weight are independent. We're saying that if we know that someone has diabetes, then we treat them as being independent. OK, that's conditional, uh, conditional independence. Um, so, in other words, uh, if I have the probability of x i j, um, and uh, I condition on x i m and c k, uh, then so what does this mean? This means that uh, what's the probability that the blood pressure is something? If I know information about whether or not they're diabetic, diabetes. And given that I know their weight, oh, and uh, sorry, let me just let me make this clear. Uh, this is the independence assumption, right? The independence means that uh, if these two guys are independent, uh, then it's just the product of the probabilities. Another way to write this is that uh, two things are independent um, if. Uh, if you know, if I'm trying to find the probability of something and I condition on a piece of information, if they're independent, uh, then the piece of information gives me gives me no help, so I can just completely remove it and just write this. Okay. So similarly, what I'm saying here is uh, the probability of the blood pressure, uh, given that I know the weight and and I know the class as diabetes, is the same as writing uh, the probability of the blood pressure uh, given diabetes. So this is called conditional independence, and uh, the reason I wrote it this way is because now, if you go back to our, um, if we go back to the problem up here, okay, well, we can write that probability of xi given ck. Okay, well, what happens to the first part? If I know the class, I don't need any of the other features. And similarly, for the for every other term in this expansion, uh, we can get rid of all the conditioning on the on the uh, other features. Okay, and I can write this for simplicity: the probability of CK times the product of uh, J equals one to P, probability of XIJ uh, given CK. OK, and uh, why is this so nice? Or why does this make life so much easier? Well, think about the problem that we had before. Uh, the problem was that we need to estimate uh, all those probabilities. And every time you have features in, in the conditioning uh, statement, you get more and more terms that you need to estimate. Uh, but the naive Bayes assumption, so this is, again, let me just put naive Bayes here, just to make it very explicit, that this is not obviously equal to, unless you make this assumption. Uh, the naive Bayes assumption tells us that the features are conditionally independent on the class. And so uh, each class, uh, you know, the probability of a particular feature given the class um, uh, can be written like this. And so now we only have 
uh, you know, much less, much fewer terms to estimate uh, than before. Okay, so for example, when xij is binary and ck is binary, okay, how many terms do we have to estimate? Uh, well, we just need to estimate two terms, right? So there is, uh, and, and that, that's going to hold for every feature. Uh, so the total number of, uh, of, of terms to estimate is much lower and uh, we should be able to handle it uh, with any reasonably sized uh, data set. Okay, so um, so this is basically the setup of the uh, naive Bayes kind of classification world. Um, and it, it is a very strong um, like mathematical assumption that we've made uh, conditional independence of the, of the features uh, because you can imagine in a lot of tasks, um, you know, for example, like uh, uh, trying to predict if someone has diabetes, uh, you know, the blood pressure and weight uh, are going to be correlated, right? Like if you're if you if you are uh, overweight, um, you know, that tells you something about blood pressure, and so that's going to help you in the modeling. Um, it just turns out uh, that this is not a terrible assumption, uh, in the sense that uh, we still get reasonable models. Uh, so we can still get some kind of good performance from the classification. Uh, it's also um, it's also kind of like looking at the uh, alternative. Well, if the alternative is that we have no model at all because uh, it's impossible to fit the model, uh, then this is clearly uh, you know uh, much better to have something rather than nothing. Um, of course, uh, there are models in between. So naive Bayes is kind of the most extreme assumption. Uh, um, you could still have models that are, uh, for example, um, you could still have a dependence of a particular feature on, uh, so xij, uh, xim, and ck. Uh, you could assume that the, these are not conditionally independent, uh, but they're conditionally independent from all other features. Or you could assume that, you know, for a few features, they are not conditionally independent on some other uh, features. So. Um, as you do that more and more, uh, you're going to get uh, more and more parameters to estimate. Uh, but the point is that uh, there's two extremes. The, the one that we saw uh, initially, where you have way too many parameters, and the naive Bayes one, uh, which is the most extreme assumption uh, from the other side, uh, where you have the least number of parameters. Okay, so uh, let's actually just explore uh, naive Bayes more by looking at this uh, example uh, that you saw in the lectures uh, in a bit more detail. Uh, so here I've just written out the um, uh, the data set. Uh, so each uh, E, E1 to E4, uh, are emails. Oh, well, they're all emails. Uh, the first four are emails in the um, that are spam, uh, meaning like junk email. Um, so so spam or junk, um, and the rest uh, we just call them ham. Uh, which means not junk. I actually don't know why they're called ham. I don't know if that's just to be funny or if, if they're actually called that. Uh, but that's kind of what you'll you'll hear it referred to in the in the literature. Um, okay. So uh, in other words, uh, we have two. Uh, so k, uh, the classes, um, uh, can either be uh, uh, spam, uh, which I'll write as a plus, uh, or ham. Uh, which I'll write as a negative, uh, or you can also think of them as uh, one, zero. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a binary classification problem. Um, and uh, let's just remove the uh, difficulty of the prior. Um, but if you were going to estimate the prior, well, there's 50-50, right? There's there's 50% chance uh, of seeing uh, class plus, uh, and there's 50% chance of seeing Class negative, so uh, we're just going to assume this is estimated as as 50%. Um, uh, it's not really that important uh, in this in this problem, but uh, um, we're just going to take it as the uh, as the you know just overall uh, mean uh, sample average. Um, and then to explain exactly what's going on with the emails, um, so each email uh, has a number of words, um, and we're told that. Uh, um, the vocabulary uh, which I'll write as the capital letter V uh, is just the words uh, A, B, and C. So you can think of these, uh, B is actually a word, uh, but D uh, we're going to remove, E we're going to remove, 
D and E we're going to remove. So uh, the reason that we remove some words, um, uh, so D uh, is called a stop word, uh, which means it's kind of like a word that doesn't really uh, give us much um, information. So it's like a word like uh, the or and. Uh, whereas vocabulary vocabulary words are words that give us context. So for example, A could be uh, casino or uh, or it could be um, uh, meeting. Okay, so you can imagine that if you see an email with casino, uh, it's more likely to be a spam email, and that gives us some context about the about the email. Uh, but if you see a, 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 a email with meeting, uh, that gives us some context about maybe it's like a work email. Um, and the stop words give us like very little context. So uh, again, this is another assumption, is that we're just going to throw them away. Um, and the reason is, remember, as you include more and more features, uh, you have more things to estimate. So you really have to ask yourself the question, um, are these worth uh, estimating more parameters uh, for? And the answer is usually no. So uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, uh, you should take, I think there's a natural language processing course, uh, but this, this area is pretty huge. And um, it's almost become uh, somewhat disconnected from machine learning. It's kind of its own field. Um, and the same thing goes for uh, computer vision. Um, I mean, they're still technically machine learning, but uh, they've just become so specialized uh, that you can become a natural la language processing kind of researcher or, or uh, engineer, uh, where all you do is look at NLP and they have kind of their specific types of models and, and uh, specific type of types of algorithms and same thing for computer vision. So they've, um, I think we have, uh, UNSW offers both of these courses uh, if you're interested, uh, but we're just getting kind of like the, the most simple uh, look at these um, problems. Okay, and then the next uh, step is, uh, you know, we need to, so here, by the way, this is called a uniform uh, class prior. Again, the class is just a, a word for context. You don't need to really think about it. Uh, it's just a uniform prior, which just means that I give equal weighting to all, uh, to all uh, classes. <clears throat> all right, so the next thing uh, to do uh, for the naive Bayes setting is to uh, compute, well, is to kind of choose um, the class conditional distribution. Okay, uh, and this kind of is up to the modeler. So it's up to you to figure this out, uh, to choose an appropriate model. Um, and depending on the choice of the model, so choice of model, uh, kind of tells you uh, how you are, uh, um, how we represent uh, each email, each email. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, that means that if I choose, uh, so let, let me just give an example, maybe that'll make it clear. So the, the, the two types of uh, distributions that we're gonna look at are the multivariate uh, Bernoulli um, and the multivariate Bernoulli looks at, um, you know, for each word, uh, it, it asks the question, uh, does uh, the word um, appear? Okay, and the second type is called uh, the multinomial model, multinomial, um, well, I, I guess they should call it multi, multinomial and multivariate Bernoulli naive Bayes. Uh, it asks, um, uh, you know, uh, what is the uh, um, well, I guess it asks what is the the uh, probability of seeing the word. Um, in other words, uh, uh, the multivariate Bernoulli just cares uh, whether or not the word appears. Uh, uh, it doesn't really care about how many times it appears. Okay, whereas the multinomial uh, naive Bayes actually wants to look at the proportion or, or actually looks at the, pro uh, the probability of seeing the word. Um, so for example, um, uh, let's say you, you're considering the word gambling. 
or let's say Gambo. Um, if you're under the multivariate Bernoulli, uh, you just care if this word comes up or it doesn't come up. So it's just appear or doesn't appear. Uh, whereas in the multinomial naive Bayes, uh, you care if it comes up once versus if it comes up three times in the same email. Um, so you can imagine that the word gambo uh, is kind of common to use in normal English. Uh, you might just be, you know, having using a metaphor uh, saying, you know, that move was a gamble. Uh, but if it, if it comes up like four times in an email, uh, then that gives you more information that the email is probably a junk email um, asking you to gamble at some online casino. Okay, so uh, depending on the choice of the uh, class conditional distribution, uh, we're actually going to uh, represent um, the data, the observations um, in a in a different um, in a different way. Okay, so for the so for the um, for the multivariate Bernoulli, uh, so let's I'll just do it here because I want to use the, the table. Uh, we're going to have um, e1, e2. E3, E4. Okay, and uh, well, the features, right? Let's let's write out the features uh, for x i, um, and let me let me use this notation x i a, uh, x i b, and x i c. So remember, the vocabulary is just a b c. So now I'm looking at these features, xia, xib, and xic, uh, which means um, that, uh, so xia is equal to, well, this is a Bernoulli, okay? Um, so I guess what I should actually just verify, xi little v is a Bernoulli. Um, and uh, let me write the probability as uh, p, um, sorry, I should. Okay, so this is this is the assumption in the multivariate Bernoulli. Um, so okay, this looks kind of weird, but remember, uh, what we're doing is we're picking a class conditional distribution. So given the clause, uh, we have a distribution for the feature, and the multivariate Bernoulli says, okay, uh, model it as a Bernoulli. This probability here, okay, is the probability of seeing uh, word V in a spam email. Okay, and that means that XIV uh, is a random variable that's Bernoulli distributed. And what do we know about Bernoulli? Uh, we know that it can take the value one or zero uh, and it takes the probability one with probability P plus V and it takes the prob it takes the value zero with one minus uh, P plus V. Okay, so how do I represent the first email? Well, we look at the first email and we look and we ask if there's any A's uh, there's no A's, so it's a zero. Uh, for the for the B's, well, there's three B's, but again, uh, this is a we're just seeing, we're just asking whether or not a B is, is present, uh, and that's a one, and a C is zero. Okay, similarly for email two, there's no A's, uh, there are B's and there are C's. And if we just continue. Um, uh, the same thing. I'm oh, sorry. There's a B uh, for E5. There's an A and B. Okay, and E8 has uh, just stop words, so it's got nothing. It's got no uh, A's, B's, or C's. Uh, so this is basically how we're representing each data point. So this is the feature vector, right? So for email one the feature vector is just zero, one, zero. Okay, so then the question is, uh, how many parameters uh, do we have to estimate? Okay, well, if you look at this model, um, we're going to have a, uh, a probability for each Bernoulli distribution, and there's 
a, a probability for each word and for each clause. Okay, so if you think about it, uh, the, the, the parameters of the model, so model parameters, uh, well, for the positive class, we have to estimate p plus a, p plus b, p plus c. And for the negative class, we have to do the same. Okay, and remember, each of these are probabilities of, of seeing uh, the word in that particular class. Um, okay, how do we estimate a Bernoulli probability? Well, if you go back to the uh, supplementary video for tutorial one, uh, we did the maximum likelihood uh, for the Bernoulli model, and we showed that it's simply um, the sample average, right? So uh, remember the coin toss example. So uh, if x1, xn are Bernoulli theta, uh, then the maximum likelihood estimate is just the sample average, right? So we need to look at the number of successes and divide by the total number. So for PA plus, right, uh, let's just first ask, what is the total number of uh, things we should divide by? Well, this is conditional on the class um, and we have four emails in the class. Okay, so it's gonna be something divided by four. Uh, the something is the number of successes we get in four trials. Uh, well, for uh, the word A, uh, we actually get uh, uh, two successes out of four. Okay, so uh, our parameter estimates, and these are, again, these are maximum likelihood estimates. Uh, I mean, maximum likelihood in this particular problem is, uh, is extremely uh, straightforward, um, a very intuitive result, right? Like you just divide the frequency by the total number of things in the class, uh, but I just want you to just always kind of keep this in the back of your head that we're not just randomly computing probabilities. This is actually the maximum likelihood estimate. Uh, so P plus A, uh, we said is two over four. Uh, and P plus B, uh, well, if you go back, um, if you look at uh, in, the six, in the spam clause, how many of them had the word B, uh, three out of four did. Okay, and if I keep doing this um, exercise, I'll get uh, these probabilities. So now we're looking at the negative class for A, uh, the negative class for B. Let me just make it clear. Uh, and the negative class for C uh, is also a one over four. Okay, all right, so, uh, this is our model, this is our naive Bayes model. Uh, so let's actually put it into uh, action. Let's assume uh, we get an e a new email, E star, and uh, let's assume that this email is A, B, B, uh, D, E, B, B, okay? And I don't know the clause, right? It's a new email. Um, okay, well, under our model, we need to represent uh, the email as a feature vector. And remember, the feature vector is xia, xib, xic, transpose. Uh, and in this case, we need to count the number of a's. It's just one. Uh, uh, we need to count, uh, sorry, not the number, but we need to see if there is an a. Uh, is there a b? There is. And is there a c? Uh, there isn't. Okay, um, and then uh, we need to look at our rule for classification. It's the argmax uh, for um, k in plus or minus of the probability, sorry, of the probability of ck times the probability of x star given ck Okay, and this is going to be the arg max of the two probabilities, 
probability of C plus, probability of X star given C plus, and the second probability for C minus, probability of X star given C minus. Now, uh, because we took uh, PC minus and PC plus both to be, uh, to be uniform, to both be half, uh, the prior probability is actually not going to play a role uh, in this maximization, right? Because uh, if you multiply all the numbers inside by the same thing, it doesn't make any difference, okay? So this is a problem where the posterior, uh, the class conditional probability is actually going to dominate everything. Um, but that's just, a, uh, and I'm still going to write it because you still need to take care of the prior usually, but I just want you to be aware that in this particular case, uh, uh, they don't play a role, uh, but in the general case, they, they do play a role. Uh, so let's just look at the first uh, probability. Uh, well, under the uh, Bernoulli naive Bayes model, uh, this is going to be equal to, uh, sorry, probability of C plus as well. Uh, this is going to be equal to the probability of C plus times uh, all the words in the vocabulary. So this means that I'm going to be taking a product over all uh, V in the vocabulary of the particular feature X star J, uh, sorry, Uh, let me write it. Uh, um, uh, sorry, the notation's a little bit uh, messy, but I just want to make it really clear. Um, we could just write it as, uh, you know, we could write it as xj equals to x star j given c plus. Right, this is the naive Bayes assumption. The naive Bayes assumption says that we can break up uh, the joint, uh, sorry, the conditional uh, uh, probability of the data given the class into a product uh, that factorizes over the features. And X star J, these, these terms are just the uh, three terms, um, uh, sorry, I should have X star A, X star B, X star C, okay? So what is the probability that the Jth feature, uh, again, Notation is not good. This should be V, because I'm summing over V. Okay, uh, what is the probability that the Vth feature takes on the particular value seen in X star? Um, and, and under our model, we're assuming this is Bernoulli. So this is the probability uh, C plus times, uh, let's, let's look at it uh, very carefully. The first V in the vocabulary is A. So probability that the uh, feature, you know, the flag for A is equal to X star A given C plus times the probability that X B equals to X star B given C plus times the probability of X C equals to X star C given C plus. Uh, and I'm just being really pedantic here and writing every little step out. Uh, you don't have to do that in practice that x a well okay what is x star a uh, it's it's one right so this is one given c plus uh, probability that x b is also equal to one given c plus and probability that x c equals to zero given c plus so this is the this is the actual observed these are the actual observed values in the feature vector at one one zero um, <clears throat> okay, so this is equal to probability of C star. Okay, what is this probability here? Well, XA is Bernoulli, uh, sorry, I need to be really careful. XA given C plus is a Bernoulli P plus A, right? And what is the probability that XA equals one given C plus? Well, hopefully you know that what is the probability that a Bernoulli variable is equal to one? Uh, well, that's just the probability, right? P A plus. So this becomes P A plus. The same exercise here. Uh, but what about this guy? What's the probability that a Bernoulli random variable is a fail? It's, a, it's, a, it's not a success, it's a failure. Um, so that's, hopefully you, you recall, that's just one minus uh, P C plus. 
Okay, and that just comes from the way uh, we define the Bernoulli random variable, right? Uh, it's one with probability p and zero with probability one minus p. Okay, and now uh, we can put in our fitted values, the, the estimates for these parameters. Uh, well, we had a half and pa plus was two over four. That's also a half. Uh, p plus b uh, was three over four. And one minus uh, pc plus is one minus one over four. Um, let's see if my mental maths uh, will work quickly. This is going to be three over 16 times three over four, uh, which is nine over 64. Okay, so this is the probability, uh, well, this is this number here. So we're gonna take the arg max of the first guy, which is nine over 64. And now we need to repeat the analysis for the second guy, doing exactly the same thing, but uh, using the probabilities uh, for the minus class. Let me do it here. Um, well, actually, let me, let me, yeah, let me, now we're looking at C minus, right? So, so you see that the conditional, the class conditional probabilities are going to be slightly different. They're going to be uh, based on the C minus class. I'm not going to write it all out. The first term is still going to be half. The second term is, um, uh, uh, the second term is, um, P, uh, well, we, we observed a one, right? So it's it's P A minus, P B minus, and then again, one minus P C minus, uh, which turns out to be nine over 128. Okay, and so clearly this number is bigger. So this is going to be class positive. Okay, because the argument uh, is the first argument, uh, which is the, the positive class. And so that's basically um, how we, how, um, you know, how this naive base classifier works. It's pretty simple and it's quite intuitive. It's kind of what you would have done um, had you not assumed there was a model at all. Uh, you, you would have probably um, just multiplied the probabilities of, of, of the frequency of uh, seeing the words uh, together. Um, okay, but one thing to be aware of is uh, imagine that we uh, we observe uh, the same four enos, um, and uh, let's just imagine e five to e six, uh, sorry e eight, uh, stay the same. Uh, but let's imagine that now uh, <coughs> e e one to e four. Uh, uh, don't have any presence of the word A. Uh, so uh, let's see. Just want to copy it down correctly. Okay. Uh, so we have a problem here. Okay. Um, and the problem is that we uh, we actually never see uh, X I A. Uh, we never see the word A. Uh, so this could happen, for example, if um, you know, in your in your data set, you just never see a particular word, uh, so the classifier is just hasn't been exposed to that word before. Um, so uh, the problem here is that uh, your estimate for PA plus uh, is going to be the total number of uh, positives, uh, the total total number of uh, emails that have the word A uh, in the positives. Uh, so that's going to be zero. Uh, so what's the problem with that? Well, if you look at the computation that we did here, uh, here we're multiplying by PA plus. And uh, this is going to be zero now. So what happens is that uh, the entire probability for the class is, is, is dominated by a single probability, uh, single feature. So if I've never seen the word A, that just tells me that I'm, that I'm always going to classify this email um, as having zero probability of belonging to the positive class. Uh, generally, you know, you're building a model uh, with multiple features. You don't want a single feature to dominate uh, your decision, right? You want it, you want your decision to be a function of all the features. Uh, so this is problematic behavior. 
Uh, also notice that, uh, for example, uh, you'll get this problem if, um, if uh, imagine that you also, let's say, uh, let's say that you, uh, uh, you actually observe the word C in every, uh, in every email in the positive class, uh, then your estimate of PC plus is going to be one. Okay, and that's equally problematic uh, because uh, when you get a, a new email that might not have the word <clears throat> C, such as the one we were dealing with here, uh, you'll see that uh, you'll get a one minus PC plus. Uh, so now it's being dominated by this term, which is also going to be zero, right? One minus one uh, is going to be zero. And so uh, again, it's problematic uh, because the one, one feature is really dominating everything. Okay, so uh, let me just stick to the original. The original uh, counts that we had, which was uh, zero, one, zero, zero. Okay. Uh, so in this problem, we're going to have uh, these estimates to be zero. Uh, now, the way to get around this is to um, basically do uh, something called smoothing. Okay, so smoothing. Uh, the estimates. Okay, and smoothing just basically amounts to um, uh, adding uh, pseudo counts, pseudo counts. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, well, that means that, um, uh, well, let's just imagine that um, we're just looking at the positive class. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to add, uh, so again, the problem is that we never, we never saw the word A. Um, or the problem is that we always see the word A. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add a pseudo count. Uh, I'll call it E plus one and E plus two. Uh, and we need two pseudo counts in this particular problem uh, because um, you have two classes, right? So there's always the possibility of getting, uh, uh, of, of not seeing um, uh, one of the features um, yeah, sorry, sorry. We have two values uh, for the for the. Sorry, let me repeat that. Uh, we have uh, uh, two values, uh, zero or one, for each of the features. Uh, so uh, there's always a, a risk of running into um, the case where you never see it or you always see it. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to add these pseudo counts, uh, which are fake emails, right? Uh, where uh, we either um, see every word in the email or we see none of the words in the email. And the reason we do this is now because is, is because uh, we'll never get a probability estimate of zero, and we'll never get a probability estimate of one anymore. Okay. So what we're doing is we're looking at the row, uh, sorry, at the at the column, and we're just ensuring that you never get a column of zeros, and never get a column of ones. Okay, because that would result in an estimate of zero or one. Okay, and and just to uh, see what happens to the probability estimates now. Okay, and by the way, we need to do this for uh, the negative class as well, right? So I'm going to add e minus one, e minus two, as well. Same, exact thing. Uh, the estimate for PA plus uh, will uh, the estimate I'm going to have a one positive, uh, but now I'm going to have six uh, emails in total, right? So the maximum likelihood is how many successes uh, in total are there? Okay, and similarly, uh, PP plus uh, is gonna be uh, four and six, and PC plus is gonna be uh, two and six. Okay, and uh, PC, sorry, P, PA minus uh, is going to be, you know, the same thing with these extra counts. Okay, so uh, this pseudo count thing isn't very, um, uh, it's not too difficult. It's basically just uh, making sure the numbers never give you zero or one. Uh, it's kind of a hack. 
um, it changes the probability slightly, uh, but it fixes the overall problem of uh, having one feature uh, dominate dominate the, the entire probability. Okay, so uh, that's the multivariate Bernoulli uh, naive Bayes model. Um, so now we can move on to the second model I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, multinomial um, naive Bayes multi nomial uh, naive Bayes. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, what is the multinomial distribution? Uh, so we write that x is a random variable uh, with multinomial distribution, um, and it has parameters n, uh, k, and then uh, p1 uh, to pk are probably, actually let me call them uh, something slightly different. Let me call them uh, theta1 to uh, theta k, um, and let me use capital K. Okay, so this thing looks uh, kind of scary because it has a lot of parameters, <clears throat> but really it's it's um, it's quite a nice distribution that comes up often. Uh, it's basically assuming that um, uh, we repeat uh, um, an experiment uh, n times and um, there are k or capital K uh, possible outcomes. Um, and each of the trials are independent. So you can think of this as kind of a generalization of the uh, binomial distribution. Uh, well, it is a generalization of the binomial distribution. Um, uh, but now we've got um, k possible things happening uh, rather than just <clears throat> uh, success and failure. So um, uh, you can think of it as a, uh, we can think of an example. Uh, let's think of a fair uh, die, fair dice uh, with, uh, so in this case, there's uh, k equals to six possible outcomes and uh, theta one is the probability of um, uh, seeing a one. So it's one over six. And this is going to be equal to theta 2, uh, theta 3, equals to uh, theta 6. So um, if we roll a fair-sided fair -sided die 10 times um, and basically count the numbers uh, that we see uh, fall into each bin, uh, so for example, um, an outcome of this experiment could be, uh, say, 6, 6, 5, uh, four, one, one, one. How many is that? That's three, four, five, six, seven, um, two. Okay. Uh, so this would be uh, on uh, trial one, we saw six. On trial two, we saw six. On trial three, we saw five. Uh, in this case, the uh, the value that the that the multinomial, uh, like if we sampled from this particular multinomial. Uh, the vector, this is what we would have seen. So it would have been uh, the counts of the number in uh, bin one. So there's uh, three ones, uh, there's one two, uh, there's two threes, uh, there's a single four, a single five, uh, and then two sixes. Okay, so let me just make sure this all counts up to 10. So three, four, six plus four is 10. Okay, so uh, basically, uh, the multinomial distribution, you can think of it as a distribution on histograms. Okay, because if you think about this x, x vector, uh, you can plot it on the, um, um, you can plot it. So here I'm, I've got the k outcomes, and then I can plot the counts, uh, the frequency. Uh, well, actually, let me just plot the counts. Um, <clears throat> in the in the one vector, I'd have uh, three. Uh, in the two, I'd have uh, just one, um, and I'd have two threes, um, uh, and then I'd have uh, one each in the four and five, and then in the six, I'd have uh, two. Okay, so this is a histogram, right? 
you would have seen this hopefully at some point. Um, and basically, uh, if I if I if I if you see the terminology x1, x2, up to xn uh, coming from a multinomial uh, with parameters n, uh, k, <clears throat> and theta one to theta k, uh, that means that each one of these guys is a vector, okay, in uh, in R uh, k. Right. So uh, if you think about this in this example, we just saw one observation uh, from the multinomial distribution um, in that case. Okay. So uh, this is why we call it a, a distribution on histograms. All right. So um, to to close off the intro of the multinomial, uh, the probability that uh, the probability mass function, right? Uh, now keep in mind, this is a vector, right? Uh, is equal to, um, well, let me actually even write it a bit more explicitly. Uh, this is a vector uh, x. So this is the probability that the multinomial is equal to x1 to x uh, k. Uh, where each little x1 is like asking, what is the probability that you know we have x1, little x1, many uh, values fall into the first bin, and uh, here we're asking how many, uh, what you know, xk, uh, you know, what's the probability of seeing xk many? This is the number. Say this is five, for example. What's the probability of seeing five fall into the kth bin? Um, and this has a uh, um, a uh, a form that's very similar to the binomial. Um, it's n factorial times x1 factorial all the way up to xk factorial uh, times theta1 x1, uh, theta2 x2, all the way up to theta k xk. Okay, so hopefully this should look very uh, familiar to you because, um, uh, well, uh, what happens if we take uh, k equals to um, 2, okay? Uh, okay, uh, one thing I should mention is that um, the sum of the theta uh, j's, j equals 1 to k, has to be 1, right? If it's a, if it's a, it's a fair-sided die, you know, uh, the probabilities have to sum up to one. Okay, um, so uh, this should look familiar to you because uh, if you remember from the binomial distribution, um, x binomial and p, uh, what was the distribution there? Well, probability x equals to little x was um, n x, so n com combination x, uh, p to the power of x, one minus p to the power of n minus uh, n minus x. And uh, if we just expand this top part out, you would get n factorial over x factorial n minus x factorial uh, px 1 minus p n minus x. Okay, uh, well, if you take the k here uh, to just be 2, right, you would actually get exactly the same. Um, you, would get, you would get exactly the same thing. Um, as this distribution, uh, because uh, you'd have theta one and theta two. Um, uh, uh, theta two would just be one minus theta one, right? Because they have to sum up to one, so you would just get this p and one minus p. Um, the x one and the x two would have to add up to n, so we could write x two as n minus x one. Okay, and so it's exactly the binomial distribution. So you can think of the multinomial as a distribution on histograms. Uh, you can think of it also as a uh, generalizing. Um, the binomial to k outcomes. Okay, not just binary outcomes, but k outcomes. All right, so uh, you can kind of see what's, uh, hopefully you can see what's going on here. We're going to treat each email as a sample uh, from the multinomial distribution, right? We're going to use the, we're going to use the, um, uh, we're going to use the multinomial to model the uh, class conditional uh, distribution. Okay, um, and uh, in this case, 
right? Hopefully it's, it's clear to you, uh, now we actually care about the frequency, right? We, we care about the count, the number, of, um, the number of times we see an event. So if we're treating the words in the email um, uh, using the multinomial, uh, we now care about uh, the number of words or the number of times we see a particular word uh, in an email. So if we, um, if we encode the same set of emails again, Okay, again, same exact uh, example as I started off with. Um, okay, uh, and we're still gonna have three features. Uh, we'll call them XIA, XIB, and XIC again. Um, but now, uh, just be careful. Okay, we don't just care about seeing the word in a particular email, we care about the number of times uh, it appears in the email. So if we look at email one, uh, how many times does A pop up? Uh, well, it pops up zero times, right? How many times does B pop up? It pops up uh, three times. And how many times does C pop up? It pops up zero times. Okay, so uh, what we're gonna see here is a different encoding, uh, zero, three, zero. Okay, so this particular encoding cares about frequency. Uh, now, if you do this for all the rest, uh, it should be pretty straightforward um, to see uh, that it's gonna give you this particular uh, representation. Um, Um, yeah, because the eighth email has uh, all stop words. All right, so, um, and what we're gonna do is uh, choose to model the conditional distribution um, XC plus as a uh, multinomial distribution. Uh, um, Uh, with uh, with n and trials uh, k uh, possible outcomes and uh, theta one to theta k uh, probabilities of seeing those outcomes. Um, so so to estimate this guy, uh, we need to actually look at the um, look at the data a little bit differently uh, than we were doing before. Uh, we're basically going to ignore the fact. Um, that the emails are kind of uh, different emails and just treat them all as one big um, experiment uh, where we uh, have three possible outcomes, the word A, B, C, and uh, we run the kind of, you can think of them as, as a three-sided die, and we toss the die um, independently. Uh, the total number of times is the total number of words we see in the class, okay? So in other words, uh, we imagine that N is equal to uh, the sum of uh, all the words, sorry, I should circle this as well, the sum of all the words in the positive class. Uh, so that's um, five words in the A class, nine here, and then three here. Uh, so in total, we have 17 words. Uh, we have uh, K equals to three uh, possible uh, outcomes for each uh, so, so you think of the, the die kind of generating words. Um, at each throw of the die, uh, we see a word. And um, so obviously we're gonna have theta one, uh, theta two, and theta three. And I'll call them, uh, I'll call these parameters uh, theta a, theta b, and theta c plus. So uh, the probability now is like, uh, the probability now uh, that these thetas represent is not just the probability of seeing a particular word in a class, like in the uh, Bernoulli model. Uh, now it's the probability that the next word is going to be um, an A, right? If we're just generating uh, an email. So um, it turns out that the maximum likelihood estimator uh, is actually very simple in this case as well. I'm not gonna prove it. It's, it takes a little bit more advanced math, uh, but it's just the fraction of, uh, of uh, the word a divided by the total number of words, right? Which is, is kind of intuitive. If I saw, if I, if I was tossing a die and I was trying to estimate um, the probability that a, 
a certain outcome happens, I would just divide the number of times that outcome happened by the total uh, number of trials. So um, uh, similarly, I'm going to do the uh, the same thing for the C minus uh, for the for the negative class, right? For each class gets a distribution. Uh, it's going to have n. Now its n is going to be the sum of the negative uh, words, uh, the probabilities in the negative class. Uh, so 4 plus 8, uh, 11, so that's also 17. Okay, and this is just a coincidence, by the way, right? We could have had more words um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the ham class than the spam class or the other way around. It wouldn't have made a difference. Uh, k equals to 3, and uh, theta a, theta b, and theta c, uh, but now I'm going to put a negative to represent uh, that this is for the uh, conditional class uh, distribution uh, where the class is the negative class. All right, so um, again, we've got six parameters that we need to estimate. Uh, we're going to estimate them using maximum likelihood. Uh, well, this is pretty easy. I've got five times uh, seeing the word A. I've got 17 total. Uh, these are my maximum likelihood estimates. Um, I've got nine over 17 and theta plus C. I've got uh, three over 17. Similarly, um, for the negative class, Okay, we count uh, 11 A's, uh, we count three uh, B's, and three C's. Okay, um, and now we have our uh, maximum likelihood estimates, and so that's it. So we're good to go now. We can um, start estimating, uh, or we can start predicting uh, for new emails uh, what class they should belong to. So uh, let's deal exactly with that same uh, email that I had before. Uh, let me just uh, look up what that email was. Okay, so it was um, A, B, B, D, B, B, B. Um, and we now represent it as the vector X star, uh, which is going to be uh, 1, Four, zero, right? Because now, uh, now we're taking counts of these things, uh, not just um, uh, binary values. And um, well, let's start off with the probability of CK. Well, prob let's do the positive class. Okay, uh, well, let me just plug in the formula uh, for the multinomial distribution. Uh, it's n factorial over x1 factorial, x2 factorial, x3 factorial. Okay, and when I write, uh, um, uh, when I write x1, x2, x3, again, this x star is a vector, uh, x1, x2, X3, let me write, uh, sorry, maybe I should just make it really clear. Um, X star A, X star B, X star C, and uh, then here I can use the same notation, X star A, X star B, X star C, uh, times the theta A plus uh, to the power of X star A, uh, theta b plus to the power of x star b, and theta c plus to the power of x star c. So it is a bit um, tedious, the notation, but I just want to make it as clear as possible uh, where every little piece goes. Um, so let's just plug in the numbers. Probability of c uh, plus is a half, n factorial, well, in this case, you need to look at the uh, number of words in this histogram, right? Uh, here we have, um, uh, here we have, uh, uh, sorry. Um, here we have uh, the histogram, which is uh, 
just of length five. Okay. Um, maybe this example is not great for this particular case. Let me just cheat a little bit and put uh, two C's here, and then we'll go back to the zero case uh, when we talk about smoothing. So let's just put uh, one, four, two. So uh, this histogram, right, has uh, one plus four plus two, uh, seven words in total or seven uh, trials. So uh, we need to use that particular um, that particular value for n. Uh, then the values of the x star a, x star b, x star c um, are just going to be uh, one factorial, four factorial, and two factorial. Um, and then the value theta plus a is uh, five over seventeen to the power of one. Uh, 9 over 17 to the power of 4, and um, uh, 3 over 17 to the power of 2. Okay, um, I'm not going to compute this because it's going to be uh, tedious and just, uh, just a bunch of calculation, but basically uh, we just get a number here, okay, and then uh, we compare this number to the uh, to the other probability, probability of c minus, uh, probability of x star given c minus, and we pick we pick the larger one. Okay, so uh, this is how we uh, use the uh, multinomial naive Bayes for prediction. Okay, hopefully it's um, uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's a different model. It's a different uh, maximum likelihood estimator, but it's it's just kind of two ways of uh, modeling. Um, so with the same data set, there's two ways of looking at it, two ways of encoding the emails, um, and we get slightly different estimates. Well, not slightly, it could be quite different. So, um, you know, this, this model makes a lot more sense um, for, for email classification because, um, you know, it, it, the presence of a single word in an email might not be enough to, to flag uh, that it's spam. Okay, you might want to know the frequency. Uh, it tends to be that junk email uh, might repeat uh, uh, phrase words, um, and so the multinomial might uh, be somewhat more accurate. Um, one thing I wanted to cover before uh, we finish up is um, the uh, the problem uh, with estimation that crops up in this case. Okay, um, so if we uh, if we Consider um, the following alteration, okay? So imagine that uh, here uh, we just saw zero, and here we just saw zero, okay? Uh, then we have the problem uh, that uh, the estimate for theta a plus is gonna be zero over 17, which is uh, zero. And actually, it's not gonna be divided by 17. It's going to be, uh, you know, we're only gonna have three, six, nine, uh, 12 words. So this is gonna be nine over 12, three over 12. Okay, but the problem really is that we're going to get a zero, um, and then if you look at the uh, computation down here, uh, you know you're going to get a zero probability, and so you're always going to uh, be predicting zero for the positive class, regardless of the word, um, and that's obviously not a good um, outcome uh, because again, a single feature is dominating uh, the model just because you haven't seen it in your in your training set uh, before. Uh, so in this case, we need to do smoothing again. And uh, smoothing in this case is slightly different. Uh, if you think about what we need to do, uh, we need to add an extra email uh, where we see each of the word, each of the three words at least once, right? So uh, you can think of a, uh, let me just squeeze it in here. Okay, let me try to make it a bit neater. Uh, we're gonna squeeze in um, E uh, P plus, so pseudo count, uh, which is just a one, a one, a one. Okay, so let me just make it clear. EP1 is equal to one, one, one. And what this is doing is in ensuring that uh, regardless of what I observe, I'll never observe a zero count um, in the frequencies, right? I'll never get a zero count. So it's um, so what I'm actually doing is uh, taking the probabilities and adding one to the numerator. Okay, because I'll always get an occurrence of each word, right? I'll get a plus one, plus one, plus one. Um, but uh, to get the maximum likelihood estimate, I need to divide by total number of words. Okay, well, how many extra words have I added? I've added three extra words. Okay. And obviously the same thing is gonna happen on the bottom. 
uh, uh, on the bottom when we add um, EP, so this is EP positive, this is EP negative uh, 111. Okay, so we add an email uh, that has every single word in the vocabulary, and that just ensures that um, I will always have a non-zero frequency of that word. Okay, and uh, just be careful here when you do that correction. Uh, it's not enough to just add uh, plus one to the numerator uh, without doing anything to the denominator, right? Because the, they need to be probabilities. They still need to add up to one. Uh, so if we're adding plus one to the numerators um, and there's three uh, probabilities, uh, then we need to add uh, plus three to the, each of the denominators so that when I add all of these guys up, um, they still sum up to one, right? So just to make it painfully uh, clear, um, we have one over 20 plus 10 over 20 plus four, uh, ooh, it's not 20, sorry, it's 15. I was wondering why my probabilities were not adding up to one, uh, which is equal to 15 over 15, which is equal to one. Um, had I left the denominators uh, just to 17, uh, sorry, 12. Right? Had I add, had had I left my denominator at 12, uh, then these probabilities would no longer add up to one. They would add up to something uh, greater than one. Okay, and that's uh, that's the um, basically the multinomial smoothing. All right. So that uh, concludes uh, the email example. Um, now uh, I've actually. Um, this is a kind of a calculation heavy question, so it's kind of hard to, to kind of talk through. Uh, so I've just written up these notes uh, from uh, a couple of, well, last year, rather, when I taught, uh, when I tutored the course. Uh, so this entire uh, video is kind of based on this um, document that I'll make available on the Dropbox. Um, and you can basically read through it and uh, in your own time, and I kind of go through things a bit more slowly. Uh, so uh, hopefully, um, you know, you can use that as well um, as a reference along with the with the lecture notes.